Mr. Campbell, let, let me move on to you because you've mentioned the oversight in terms of uh, forced labor and, and what's happening, not only just with regards to the State Department. You said you know we need to look at at, at other areas, I guess, as, as well. I believe that was was your test, uh, your answer to the question. How how do we best identify that? Uh, when we when we have oversight uh, in these areas, whether it be this committee or other committees uh, with that jurisdiction, how do we best identify that? To uh, to put it uh, mildly, it's very hard to make the uh, the assumption from human trafficking, whether it be on the labor side and as it comes through in a uh, a shirt from some other country. How do we, how do we? What's the best vehicle to do that? Because I'm uh, I'm all for it, but I I, I want to see how how we can implement that. Sure. Uh, in terms of of importation of goods, uh, which is under the Department of Homeland Security, right? Um, there is a good law on the books that needs a little bit of change, and that law is the Tariff Act of 1930 that prohibits the importation of goods made with forced and forced child labor. Mm. And the current uh, way that that's implemented is if there's a reasonable basis to believe that your product contains uh, in whole or in part uh, something made with forced labor, then customs should detain it at the border and request the company to demonstrate, as provided in the regulations, to demonstrate that it does not. Hmm. Now, the reasonable basis is a lower standard than probable cause. So right. what, what they're looking at is whether there's enough information that raises alarm bells, the red flags, and then it starts a process where companies then need to go back and verify whether or not what they are doing is buying goods from that are made in part by forced labor. Uh, in terms of Uzbekistan, I highlight that because it's really simple. Every, right. Everything from Uzbekistan that is with cotton comes from the forced labor system. Um, when it comes to identifying the Uzbek cotton, say, from Bangladesh, I think it's important that brands and that the government require its contractors and their, their own subcontractors to identify whether there is Uzbek cotton in the Bangladesh factories that they're ordering from and to require that. Um, so I think there's action that both the government and private sector need to take in terms of their own supply chains in order to address this problem. In terms of what's coming to the United States, um, what we do know is that cotton from Uzbekistan does come into the United States from time to time. But Uzbekistan is a um, exporter just like the United States is for cotton. Mm -hmm. um, now, we don't produce a lot of garments anymore in the United States. Right. That production has gone overseas uh, in a race to the bottom. Um, so much of the Uzbekistan cotton that we know of goes through Bangladesh and some other countries and are processed into clothes in those countries and then brought into the United States. We have been able to identify some very specific companies. Daewoo International, a Korean company, purchases around 20% of the domestic cotton crop of Uzbekistan, processes it into yarn in Uzbekistan, and while we haven't seen many shipments, we don't have the full information, we do know that they've imported, exported into the United States um, several times uh, since 2008. Uh, we saw a $70,000 shipment come into the United States of Uzbekistan yarn just in February. And finally, we have a company known as Indorama. It's a, it's a I believe, a, a Southeast Asian company. I'd have to get the specific country. Um, and they recently shipped some yarn into Puerto Rico. And while we don't know what that factory or why, what that yarn is being used for, it does raise concerns that that yarn is being spun in American factories right. into what, whether they be possibly military garments or other products that are manufactured in Puerto Rico. So these are important issues. Um, our big concern is, and my, my uh, request back to the committee, is it's not just the State Department, it's also other agencies. So working with, with uh, the committees uh, that would have oversight of these other agencies, such as customs. There's a law that prohibits the importation of these goods that's not being enforced. And so I would encourage that these uh, examples be taken and, and pushed, and that the government from across the board, not just the State Department, but the U.S. government across the board, use all the tools at its disposal to end this forced labor scourge in Uzbekistan. And finally, last question. Um, is there a database of companies that, w that have agreed or signed on to the idea that they will not buy from a contract by materials from, a, from a, uh, another country that uses forced or child labor? Mr. Campbell? 
Um, it, we have been uh, working with many companies who have pledged to stop purchasing cotton from Uzbekistan. And what I can tell you I, and it is, uh, Hopefully on behalf of those companies we work with, they desperately need the help of the U.S. government as well because the resources of the U.S. government through enforcing things like the Tariff Act and procurement will build upon the private sector resources to identify where these products are and to clean their supply chains. Uh, the sanctions in terms of the Tariff Act are good sanctions because they are targeted. They're not on an entire country. So it's, it's when you have information that a product is being manufactured with forced labor. Who, who follows up to... to track what he's trying to track back down the slavery, back down the chain to see, so who follows that up? In who researches that? Uh, it, it's, in terms of imports, it's supposed to be DHS. Uh, often they rely on outside groups like myself to supply them the information as we do our own research with researchers on the ground. It's, it's intensive research, it's dangerous research, and so the more that the U.S. government can help us do that type of research is vital. We have tried for years to get the U.S. government to do just what, Mr. Campbell, you talked about, how the ambassador from Uzbekistan will go and testify, and apparently the Office of the Federal Trade Representatives swallows hook, line, and sinker uh, false information that is given to them or conveyed to them, even though the State Department tends to get it right in their human rights report. But that said, uh, perhaps you might want to speak to this. Uh, it seems as if the Smoot-Hawley Act, which is the tariff act that precludes the importation of slave-made goods um, is never enforced, or almost never. And I'll give you one example, and if it takes this, it shows how unenforceable or how Customs is not doing its job. Uh, when Frank Wolf and I went to Beijing prison number two, uh, which had 40 Tiananmen Square activists, we literally got some jelly shoes and some socks that were being made by the convicts and brought it here, it was, they were being sold in U.S. department stores, went to the customs people and said, you've got to put an import ban on, and they did. But I've met with our trade representatives or our customs people in our Beijing embassy in the past, and they're like the May tag repairmen. They have no job to do vis-a-vis -vis this kind of importation. You might want to take this back or give maybe an answer now. It would seem as if we have to update our efforts to combat this importation capability that goes non-used. Uh, I would point out that Mark Lagon pointed out in his, his testimony that the ILO's 20.9 million people in the world who are either human trafficking or forced labor victims, of that ILO study, he says 2.2 million or over 10 percent are from forced labor, and an um, overwhelming majority of that number comes right out of China in their Laogai system. Uh, and yet, how many import bans have there been? I don't know of any other than the one we're talking about that Wolf and I were able to get uh, the Customs Department to do. So it's a very serious problem, uh, not just in Uzbekistan, but again in China. So maybe we need to look at Smoot Hawley uh, and, and upgrade that legislation. Thank you so much for your testimony, for taking the time to prepare very extensive testimonies that, that are filled with, with um, very important and actionable information.